uh, Glasgow Rangers, uh, the people eat and sleep in Glasgow Rangers. Uh, 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 supporters go home on a Saturday night if, Rangers, uh, if the Rangers lose, they, they, they give their wife a bashing about. It's more than just a, a, a focal point to hang their sporting instincts on. It's part of their life. They grow up with it. Parents rearing kids rear them on, on, the, on the, the folklore of Glasgow Rangers as much as they do in the Bible. I was doing in England for a long time as well, you know. I used to come up to England and the, the Bolton and that, you know, travel all over for them. Oh, well, I, I spent a fortune on Rangers, you know. Oh, well, I work as a... I'm working in the parts now with a, you know, a storeman. Storeman in the parts department, Alexander Patrick's across the way there, you know. I like my job as well, but I don't work overtime. They keep asking me to work overtime, but I don't. But I like to go to the matches. I like to go to all the matches I can, you know. And the most important thing is I wanted now, so... is to get my foot to took on the eyebrow but with, with the team, you know. With the whole team, plus the managers, you know. That's what I'd like to get, you know. We certainly have a hooligan element. Uh, which damages the game of football and, and, and does it no good whatsoever. The hooligan fan uh, who causes trouble, uh, who, who when they get drunk or, or get involved in, in, in fighting mood, it seems to affect some of them that way. Uh, but the, 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 we get a very bad reputation because of that. And Barcelona uh, was a case in point, although I think there were extenuating circumstances. Um, but the Barcelona the Rangers club suffered and suffered very severely. Uh, not only dented their image, uh, but uh, uh, also halted the, the progress of the, of the playing side of the game, being out of Europe for a year. We, we, we must be in Europe, we've got to be in Europe. All good teams with ambition uh, have got to be in Europe every year. Nobody, uh, speaking about Celtic and Rangers, should avoid the question of religion. The Rangers football club is not actually a Protestant football club. It's an anti-Catholic football club. Celtic, for instance, uh, although it started as a, a Catholic uh, charitable organization, was not particularly religious. It was, it was Irish. It was a, a national organization rather than a religious organization. And they have no uh, religious scruples. Uh, I mean, there are many Protestants have played for a Celtic football club, but never a Catholic ever played for Rangers. The, the Rangers tend to take their enthusiasm uh, not from Scotland, but from Northern Ireland and from the celebrated King Billy, King William of Orange, who defeated the forces of the Stuart dynasty at the Battle of the Boyne. Now, this is believed by Protestant bigots in Glasgow to have been the victory of the Protestant over the Catholic. It's rubbish. The Vatican was delighted at it. King Billy himself was known in Europe as a friend of the convents. In his travels, he, he lived in convents. He made great benefactions of money and uh, kindnesses to the convents. But this has been turned into a great Protestant-Catholic battle. It was not. It was the old squalid struggle for power and for a throne. In Glasgow today, the battle is not between a team and a team. It's between the prods and the papes. And Rangers Football Club is dedicated to the cause of anti-popery, believing like the bigots in Northern Ireland, that the Pope is the Antichrist, the Scarlet Woman of Rome. And they still call Irishmen and Catholics Fenians. The very word is 60 years out of date. Fenians, well, De Valera, who was a Protestant, was a Fenian. But we call, in Glasgow, we call Catholics Fenians. There is a story in this very powerful Protestant area of a man who went into a pub quite near here, near Ibrooks Park, the home of Rangers, leading a live alligator, and said to the barman, do you serve Catholics in here? And the barman, looking at the alligator, decided to be discreet and said, oh, yes, sir, we serve anybody. He said, well, a pint for me and a Catholic for my friend. And that is the situation here, and it still goes on in an age when we are flinging scrap iron at the moon.
the governed Protestant is terrified that his life may be destroyed by a wee fella from Ireland. My gorge rises and my stomach quails at the sight of this idiot bigotry of the Rangers fan who will not tolerate a Tim, a Tim Malloy, a boy, a Catholic. That's really what's wrong with these greatest rivals in the world. are fighting a battle that was over long ago and even when it was there was not the battle they thought it was. Football is still a game. You may have your favourite team, whether it be Celtic, be it Rangers, but we like to think that whoever we play, we are a football team, nothing more. We are a football team who play anyone from anywhere, from any walk of life, from any religion, from any creed. That is Celtic football. Club. I hope the tradition never changes in this club. Uh, it's maybe an old-fashioned way of, of, of looking at things, but I think I'm a wee bit old-fashioned. Be quiet. I'll phone you back. Okay. Um, where was I? So, gentlemen, could I just say to you, welcome our new player manager, Graham Sunnis. With the arrival of Graham Sunnis at Ibrox Park, Glasgow, the home of Rangers Football Club, a century of sectarianism could be at an end in Scotland. Welcome to Scotland. Rangers, an establishment institution founded on the commerce of Victorian Glasgow. Discipline, tradition and Protestantism have been the watchwords. Now they're looking to Graham Sunnis for the success that will fill the stadium. On the other side of the city, Celtic Football Club, Irish in background and happy to declare it, the most successful club of recent decades. But the gulf between Rangers and Celtic is a scar as well as a division. In 1888, Celtic Football Club emerged from the grinding poverty of Glasgow's East End with a specific mission to raise money for the Catholic poor. Rangers had been in successful business for 15 years, soon setting a precedent since maintained for fine stadiums. Celtic quickly became a major power from the East End, drawing on a huge support. And with a foundation inspired by Brother Walford, a Marist from County Sligo, they identified fully with their background. The great Irish land leaguer, Michael Davitt, was the first patron and laid a centre turf of shamrocks at Celtic Park. The Irish in Glasgow identified keenly with events across the water. And Celtic's early success was spectacular. They won six league titles in a row up to 1910. The upstarts from the East End had Rangers struggling to keep pace. The arrival of Belfast shipyard workers in 1912 has been credited with giving Rangers their Protestant edge. But Calvin of Scotland was capable of producing its own reaction to an organisation that was Irish, mainly Catholic and successful. Under Bill Struth, the hard no Catholics line became enshrined. He had his autocratic counterpart at Celtic Park, Willie Maley, a man shrewd enough not to minimise the differences. In 1967, Celtic reached a pinnacle of their history. A club founded to help the poor and who had retained the loyalties of a ghetto minority were elevated to the heights of European football. 
The folk who bore the green and white headed for Lisbon. The incredible had happened. Celtic were in the final of the world's greatest club competition, the European Cup. The whole stage was set for us. We came there and everybody was there. The Celtic sport had already been there and they'd influenced the, the Portuguese to such an extent that they started to look for us to win rather than anything else. Inter Milan looked really dangerous here. Capellini was brought down by Craig. A penalty. With the spot kick, Mazzola made no mistake. And one of the best things that ever happened was the fact that they scored first. Because from then on in, it was just a fierce determination. We, we thought the penalty was very harsh at the time, but, you know, having seen it a hundred times since then on, on tape and, and whatnot, I, I'm inclined to agree the referee was right. But at that time, we felt a grievance about it. So from then on in, it was only that absolute determination to see a, a wrong as we felt it put right. And I don't think there was ever any other result than the one that was achieved. In fact, I think, to be honest with the interim line, off very lightly that day. Fullback Tommy Gemmell shot from 25 yards out. Gemmell's brilliant goal didn't put new heart into Celtic. The old one was good enough to beat anybody. And how their supporters thank their stars they'd come to Lisbon. Barely seven minutes from time came the winning goal. Chalmers deflected Murdoch's shot past Sati. was how Celtic became the first ever British team to win the European Cup. <laughs> Billy McNeil and his magnificent men earned the thanks and admiration of their native Glasgow, Scotland and the whole United Kingdom. While Celtic flourished, the rivals had sunk into a rut. In 1967, they suffered a devastating defeat at Berwick in the Scottish Cup, a trauma that had far-reaching consequences. Not least the town of Berwick was subjected to post-match mayhem, one in a sequence of such episodes that drew increasing and unwelcome attention to the Ibrooks ethos. The man who defied Rangers was a goalkeeper called Jock Wallace. Coupled with Celtic's European success, Berwick serve notice that time and football progress were passing Ibrooks by. The European Cup winners cup final, Barcelona 1972. It's a dangerous scene. Magnificent goal. Magnificent goal. Comes to Smith. Smith almost overrunning it, but keeping possession nicely. Smith now chopping it across with his left foot. Chance for the Johnston. And it's there. A prodigious kick from McCloy. Huge ball. Straight through to Johnston. Johnston in front of goal, and it's a goal. A sensational goal by Johnston. Derek Johnston to Matheson. Matheson in trouble there. And this could be dangerous. Good chance for Dynamo. And it must be a goal. It is. The substitute scores. Three minutes to play. Rangers still lead 3-1. Makovikov still going. The Russians are not finished yet. They're still trying. Makovikov coming through, and it's a goal! Makovikov scores, and that's it! That's but even it. Rangers' finest hour was to turn so. And look at that shot! Rangers players absolutely mobbed! And this is a serious moment, the Rangers players trying to get, trying to get back. Willie Waddle is submerged. Absolute bedlam, absolute bedlam. The fans came up the park, as you all know. It was all the problems, and uh, I always visualised winning a European trophy, picking up the cup and being able to go around the park and show all the supporters we had travelled halfway over Europe to see it. But I, I walked into a room similar, not, not any bigger than this, and there was a big desk, a big table like this, and the UEFA committee sitting at the back of it, and the cup in the middle, and I had my strip and everything on, and he just says, right, Rangers Football Club, winners, hand me the cup, and I walked along another corridor, and all the boys were sitting in the bath by the time I got back. They came home to the welcome that the performance in Barcelona merited. It had been a tremendous display from Rangers under Willie Waddle and coach Jock Wallace. But the violent aftermath ensured that the club once again faced...
searching questions about the dogma that set them apart. Willie Waddle eventually yielded to mounting public pressure. He went to the centre circle at Ibrooks to tell the faithful that a new era was on hand. Nothing duly happened. Except that David Hope was ditched as club chairman amidst questions about his long dead wife's religion. It was always a consideration. But then there was moments when uh, I remember coming off one day at Celtic Park and uh, um, the spectator leaned over the old tunnel and the Rangers had won this match and he addressed me in the affectionate manner that spectators always reserve for referees and then told me that it wasn't a whistle I should have, it was a flute. But at the end of the 1980s Scottish Cup final, they did come onto the field of play with a degree of nastiness that prompted wider Scottish society to call ever more insistently for change. Change in the drink laws which followed, and change also in Rangers' defiantly sectarian policy. Let's just go to the top of the tree. You see players like Pelly and Michelle Platini. You know, if they can't get a game for, and Alfredo Di Stefano, one of these guys, if they couldn't pull a Rangers jersey over their shoulder, well, I'll eat my bonnet. You know? Probably a thing about Hamden, I think it would make Rangers a better team. Although possibly a lot of Rangers fans will disagree with me on that, but I'm just speaking the truth, I feel. What's special about a Celtic Rangers game? The, the atmosphere. atmosphere. It's a game, but to other folk, it's 90 minutes of pure bigotry. It comes to, no, it's done your religion, right through. Great beatness, Celtic. Why but the ink on Graham Souness's contract was hardly dry before the bigger question was being asked around the land. The question which decades of Ibrooks and Transigens had made legitimate and inevitable. 72 hours after the Souness appointment, and the Ranger support turn out in force at Clyde Bank for the first opportunity to engage in the debate. Does their satisfaction with the impending arrival of Sunas the player and manager outweigh the tribal suspicions about the prospect of Sunas the reformer? He's an unknown quantity as a manager. He's a rare player. No surrender! But we're not caring about that as long as he does the same capital. No, Why do you say that? We went 113 years with Sunas. Why start now? If he signs out and I'll see you, right? But lose the Rangers will lose a lot of support, it's as easy as that. Well, I'll not change anything on the terraces. No, we'll still have uh, sectarian songs, we'll still be Protestants. And if these players are uh, willing to accept it, by all means, they want to play for the club. Let them play for the club. If they score three against Celtic, I'll be happy. We've got a lot of traditions at uh, Ibrox, and we don't want to see them broke for the sake of one man. As soon as I know, we like our own traditions. I think the fans are desperate now for a winning side, and if it's just to come down to that, they're not going to come down. He said that he would sign Catholics, but if I look at the big Jock Wallace, he said he would sign Catholics when he first came on, and he never ever do that. I think it's all talk. That's the order of them if it does. If we get a European Cup one, if it does, that's that. If we win a European Cup, and I'll be the first one to go and support him, right? But I want to know why all these press men don't get that Celtic for not getting a person director in their box. They don't get that man today. It's all the judges got. We've got a world-class player that you keep bringing in a legend. He's not got anybody else except us. Tradition seems rather a grand word with which to dignify the 75-year-old practice of not allowing people of a particular religion to play football for you. Is Graham Souness the man to finally lay the religious ghost? Are you prepared to play anyone of any religion? I think I've said it all before. I'd just like to, to go over it again. The job was offered to me an understanding that the situation would be um, that Catholics were going to be signed if they were good enough to play for Rangers FC. I certainly wouldn't have taken the job under any other circumstances. If they're good enough. I think at the end of the day, Jim, if people, if they're Rangers supporters, and I mean Rangers supporters, not people have got, um, are using the club as some sort of vehicle for, for anything else. Um, if they want, if they're a Rangers supporter, they want to see the team winning. That's all that matters. That's all that should matter. And uh, I shall give them. I shall try and give them that. And if that means signing Catholics and upsetting people, I shall do that. If it means getting a winning team, because at the end of the day, that's what I've been brought here for. That's all I'm interested in is winning. 
Some Rangers supporters say they won't come and watch Rangers if Graham Souness signs a Catholic. Um, well, I'm sorry to hear that, but at the end of the day, I think it's the only way forward. Look at the way the club's gone over the last... In recent years, anyway, let's not put a, a figure on it, but in recent years. And I don't think this issue has helped the club in any way. And I think um, the quicker we get rid of that, then we can make this big step forward and hopefully put Rangers where they should be. Now, Graham Souness has already said, and I understand that the Rangers chief executive and people have said that Graham Souness will be able to sign whoever he wants and it will be his football ability that will determine that. Now, at the time when I nominated and moved Kenny Dalglish as a Freeman of the city of Glasgow, one of the things that I said was that Kenny Dalglish was able to cross the bridge that was supposed to exist in Glasgow. You know, Kenny Dalglish was a, a well-known Rangers supporter as a youth and became a very successful professional footballer for Celtic. So, I mean, if, if Graham Souness, and I have no reason to doubt his sincerity when he said that he will sign whoever it is, it's their football ability. If Graham Souness is able to sign and get rid of this apparent tradition that exists at Ibrox of not having any Catholic working for them or playing for them, if Graham Souness can overcome that, then he will help the Glasgow of the future. We'll be able then to project to the world that different barriers we have, different religions we have, different communities we have in Glasgow, but we can still all work with each other for the common good. It should have been a showcase, a footballing carnival, but it turned into another indictment. One Manchester police officer became a victim of mob violence at its ugliest. Fifteen police officers were hurt. The injuries included a broken arm, a dislocated shoulder, cracked ribs and cuts that needed stitches. The policeman who was set upon escaped with bruised ribs. It had all started so well with 150,000 Rangers fans pouring into a city that boasted a £25 million boost to its economy. Much of the money must have been spent on alcohol. And when a technical fault left one of the outdoor screens blank, the anticipation turned to anger. Mobile phone footage capturing the ensuing rampage. The North West will certainly remember Rangers, but perhaps not in the way the Scots would have wished. Mike McCarthy, Sky News, Manchester.
Hello, good afternoon. Rangers Football Club, one of the most famous in Britain, has announced it's gone into administration following an unsuccessful legal bid by Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs to appoint its own administrators. Well, the club's chairman has revealed it could face disputed tax bills and penalties of up to £75 million. And Rangers will now have 10 points deducted by the Scottish Premier League. Well, the news has shocked supporters of the Glasgow Cup. These fans gave their reaction a short time ago. Worried. Worried, sir. Um, it's a big embarrassment to the club. I think Mr Murray and Mr Bain have got a lot to answer for. Uh, it's, I'm just saying to someone else, it's, it's not just the history of the club. Uh, it's the history of the families that come here together. Are you pretty upset? The league's gone and that's it. Right. The bottom line is, the big house must stay open. That's the bottom line. Gutted for every single Rangers fan. Uh, what can you do? It's happened. We need to move on now. Uh, 140 years of history. Just start again now. Uh, people up and down the country, over the world, will be watching this way. I bet it breath. People in there have made decision, bad decisions. Uh, People there just now, Mr White, but predecessors as well, who done things that probably did not help this club. But we will move on. Move on, that's what we have to do. Yeah, there's only different perspectives on who is to blame for the situation Rangers currently finds itself in. You speak to the fans, some say uh, Craig White has to share a, a bit of the responsibility, others say it's Sir David uh, Murray. But you do get a sense, really, when you speak to them about just how devoted those fa fans are to their club. This really is a big beast of Scottish football and it has been laid low as the news has started to trickle down that this club has gone into administration. Uh, the fans have started to gather outside of Ibrox. You may be able to see just down the street there, just a, a couple of hundred metres away or so, uh, a small group gathering, perhaps 50 to 100 of them. They are highly emotional, and there are also a small contingent of police down there as well. Rangers Football Club, one of Scotland's oldest football clubs, is heading for liquidation following the non-payment of millions of pounds of tax and VAT. Revenues and Customs decided to vote against a company voluntary arrangement. The decision by HMRC also means Rangers will not be able to play European football for three years. The old Rangers Football Club went into administration here at the Court of Session last February, Valentine's Day. And this financial horror story reached a sort of conclusion today, Halloween. Administration was intended to keep Rangers trading, but it didn't work out that way. The assets were sold on. So the shell of the old club will now be liquidated, wound up, only its history left. 